I think if we talk about the crisis of capitalism, instead of talking about what's happening to the Wall Street and um, you know testimonies of those uh, folks who have private jets to go into congressional hearings, instead of talking about that, I think the best way to understand the crisis of capitalism is to understand what's happening with increasing hunger. We do have a world where we have enough to provide more than 2,500 kilocalories per person per day around the world. So there is no crisis of demand and supply as it is made out to be, say, by the Gates Foundation. But today, a sixth of humanity, one sixth of humanity, nearly a billion people, according to the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, are living with chronic hunger, most of them in the developing world. My own country, India, is home to nearly 400 million people who go to bed hungry, large number of them being women and children. At the same time, many conferences are happening around the world. I mean, we had the G8 summit, and they came out with their statement on food security. The G20 met in Pittsburgh. Uh, as we gather here, FAO in Rome has been dealing with the question with high-level experts on how to feed the world by 2050. Next month is the World Food Summit, so hunger is very hot and sexy right now. And there's a lot of money in poverty and hunger, as we know from Gates Foundation's commitments. But the problem is that we do not understand hunger. Last year, for some time, it really made it big on the news. You know, the newspapers, the television sets, they were all talking about increasing hunger. The problem was the increase in food prices. Between 2005 and 2008, food prices went up by 83%. The people who were most severely impacted were in the developing world, people who spend nearly 60 to 80 percent of their budgets on food. The prices have gone down. It's no longer being talked about as much. But prices have not gone down in the developing world. More than 32 countries are identified by the World Food Program as being under severe crisis. Uh, there was much talk about what, what, what's the reason. You know, they had to offer a reason for this hunger. So we heard much about, um, well, there's a need for, uh, there's been a decline in the agricultural production growth. Uh, yes, we're not making investment in agriculture, and I'll tell you more about it later, despite what we hear about Gates Foundation. So as a result, yes, there is a decline in the growth of agricultural production. There was a decline in global grain stocks. With the trade agreements, third world countries and others have been told, don't bother to have your own grain stocks because there's a market that will take care of you. When you need grains, they'll be shipped. And we forget what happens when there are embargoes and the rest such as Iraq and Cuba. So countries have been giving up their policies of self-sufficiency. And then, of course, President Bush and Condoleezza Rice at the time were talking about, you know, it's a wonderful economic model that we've put in place, globalization, now those Indians and Chinese are eating just like us, and that is causing the food shortages. It was amazing how every newspaper talked about the increased demand from emerging economies would make you think, isn't that nice that the Indians and Chinese can eat like us? What they don't tell you is that, yes, if incomes do improve, which haven't, actually inequity has increased more in places like India, you suddenly can't start eating more. You can only eat a certain amount. What changes is what's on your plate. And if you look at India, given the cultural restrictions we have, we suddenly haven't become meat eaters. And both China and India continue net trade exporters. We have a trade surplus in food export. So while Indians are starving, we're still exporting food. So that was a big lie. So what caused hunger? What is the sudden rise in hunger? Um, Yes, there were two factors which make last year's price increase kind of unique. One is biofuels, you know, the policy of the United States and the EU to start using, say, corn for ethanol production has diverted grains for biofuel production. Lands which would grow all kind of crops are being used for biofuels. So that was an important factor. Even the World Bank acknowledged that 75% of the increase in food prices can be blamed on biofuels. The other was speculation. With deregulation, with financial liberalization, all those terms sound so liberating. Liberalization, deregulation, they're good with words. Um, what we have seen is hedge funds, index funds, uh, non-agricultural sector can now invest in agriculture. So with the decline of the housing market, investors, Wall Street was looking for another place to put their money down. And when they see the grain stocks going down, okay, we speculate in commodities. 
So if you look at the prices of wheat last year, which go kept going up and down within a span of a month or so, you know it was about speculation. But they again are just short-term factors that triggered the prices. What we really have to look at if we want to understand hunger is the structural causes of hunger in third world countries. Yes, there's been a decline in agricultural product, um, in investing in agriculture. The question, however, still remains what kind of investment. It's not enough to keep funding the kind of agriculture Stephen was talking about, which is about replacing farmers with machines, about biodiversity with monocultures, and replacing small family farms with large corporate farms. And what World Bank and IMF have managed to do is tell third world countries that you do not invest in agriculture or will pull off your loans. So just to give you some figures, um, countries on one hand reduced investment in agriculture, subsidy programs, marketing boards, they were all removed. All the things that have made agriculture work in the West, all those prescriptions were taken away from third world countries. And at the same time, multilateral investment in agricultural projects has declined. Some figures for you, World Bank decreased its lending for agriculture from $8 billion in 1980 to only $2 billion in 2004. USAID, the United States Development Agency, cut agricultural aid by 75% in the past two decades. Just 4% of current development aid to Africa goes to agriculture. So while everyone talks and comes together in these fancy gatherings in Rome and places with a state heads talk about ending agriculture, when it, it really comes to walking the talk, they have not provided any of the monies. They keep making promises. Even at the G8 summit, again, promises were made to increase uh, funding to Africa. First of all, there's no new money. This money comes with strings attached. It takes away the ability of nations to decide how food will be grown, what is grown, and who it will feed. It is colonizing those nations again, and the biggest trend that we are seeing right now is land grabs, where third world countries are being told to sell the resource that they have, their land. So countries such as China, Saudi Arabia, Japan, even my country, India, are rushing into third world countries, mainly African nations, buying up land, taking away the land where people grow their food. So they can grow food for their own people, and they can or grow biofuels. And it is all being greased by the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation. It is the blood diamond of today's hunger. The World Bank and IMF also advocated to third world countries that you need to stop state you know, interfering in state. We know that tigers became tigers in Asia because there was heavy government involvement. But countries have been told you need to move away. So as a result, we have seen, for example, marketing boards. They have been dismantled. Marketing boards used to buy grains from farmers at a fixed price. They would keep the commodities in a rolling stock, and when there was a shortage, they would release it through ration shops, where consumers who didn't have big budgets could buy basic essentials, such as lentils, the main source of protein in India, at a fixed price. They were called inefficient, they were called corrupt, and they removed them. Now, if you look at Indonesia, this country was able to achieve self-sufficiency in rice in 1984. It got a gold medal from the FAO for achieving self-sufficiency. But the IMF and World Bank told Indonesia it's a really bad idea. They got rid of the marketing board, which was called Bulag, which had played a key role in Indonesia achieving food self-sufficiency. It was done away with. Come 1996, 1998, Indonesia was the largest recipient of food aid from the World Food Program. The farmers went on strikes and protests, and as a result, Bulag was brought back in. And when the world was reeling from hunger last year, Indian, Indonesia was still able to have some state uh, institutions as a buffer. So we know those institutions work, and we keep telling third world countries to get out of agriculture, stop telling, um, interfering in agriculture. Let the market take care of it all. The other big factor has been removal of agricultural tariffs which has taken away the ability of governments to administer and govern the flow of goods into their countries. So what happens is United States and its big agribusiness corporations, Cargill, ADM, Continental, who have all these subsidies, have been pouring in their cheap subsidized commodities in third world markets, destroying the markets for the local farmers who are then displaced from land. And that makes the nation dependent on imports from the US. So when U.S. decides, okay, instead of sending corn to, say, Mexico, they are going to use it for biofuels. Mexico has to pay a very high price. There's increased hunger. 
the farmers are gone and, and they have a big import bill. FAO recognizes that there have been more than um, 12,000 import surges between 1980 and 2003 in 102 developing countries. That import surges are this sudden coming in of huge quantities of foreign grains which destroys the local markets for the local farmers. And they are the ones who then become recipients of food aid. So we are starving the food producers in third world countries. Great example of that is Ghana. In the 1960s and 70s, this nation was following policies of self-sufficiency. It was doing well. Come 1980s, World Bank IMF started putting pressure on Ghana that you need to remove your subsidies, you need to stop interfering in agriculture, let market take care of it. So let's see what happens. In 1998, Ghana's rice imports were 250,000 tons. By 2003, it had increased by 415,000 tons. So Ghana had become a great market for dumping rice from the United States. The result of this import surge was that nearly 66% of the farmers in Ghana reported losses and losses of employment. 66% of the rice growers. The same year, US government provided rice subsidies worth $1.3 billion, and 57% of US rice farms would not have covered the cost if they had not received the subsidies. So while the farmers in Ghana and their livelihoods were, were being wiped out, the US agribusiness was making a killing. That's just one example. So here is a case of a country which is self-sufficient in food suddenly being turned into a recipient of um, food aid and destruction of livelihoods. In the same time, we have heard the prescription for third world countries, hey, we can now do trade through NAFTA, CAFTA, uh, through all those bilateral regional trade agreements, and of course the World Trade Organization, shift to export crops. Majority of the HIPAC, highly indebted poor countries, depend on one commodity for their exports. It could be coffee, it could be cocoa. The prices of these commodities are very volatile. And what has happened with that is that countries such as Uganda, which followed all the prescriptions of the World Bank when it saw the coffee prices go down, it was wiped out um, in, the, in, uh, in, in, in the 2002 when the coffee prices went down. We know the evidence. FAO, for instance, says that if the prices for the 10 most important in terms of export value, agricultural commodities exported by developing countries had risen in line with inflation since 1980, these exporters would have received around $112 billion more dollars in 2002 than they did. This is twice the total amount of aid provided worldwide. It's very simple. The system that we have in place is totally upside down and backwards. We know how to feed the world. We know what the developing world needs, needs to do. And yet we keep hearing more and more of the same. One thing which people very often don't realize, because the, when we hear the word developing countries, the image that comes up is one of hunger. How many of you know that in 1960s, the developing world had the food trade surplus of $7 billion? The developing world was the food exporter. We were exporting food. Thanks to some of the policies that I mentioned, come 1970s, it had disappeared. By 2001, our deficit was $11 billion. When food is made into a commodity in the international market, people starve. Very simple, people starve. Food is a human right. It is not a commodity that market can take care of it. I mean, Anne can tell you much more about it than I could ever, but it is a human right. And that's how it has to be seen. What is pretty audacious and shameful is that as hunger increase, increases, we keep hearing the same solutions being offered over and over again. It's a crisis of demand and supply, for God's sake. We just need a little bit more trade liberalization, and everything would be fine. Last year, when everyone was talking about hunger, economists, um, the April issue talked about the biggest threat to economic globalization is the increase in food prices. For the first time, developing countries, they saw what was happening. There were food riots happening. People had nothing more to lose. They were on the streets. Governments were being toppled. Countries like India, uh, Cambodia, and others, they put in place export embargoes that they were not going to export foods. They were going to first feed the poor people. And guess what the response of the World Bank, United States, and others was? These trade embargoes are causing food shortages and increase in prices. 
It's okay for President Obama to say, you know, buy American, but when we say buy Indian, buy whatever, that becomes a trade embargo bad for international trade. So do as we say, not as we do. They were being lambasted and challenged, and I'm so glad that the countries decided to first focus on feeding their own people rather than exporting their crops. It took a lot of courage. I work a lot with third world countries, governments. It is not easy. Certainly the entire fault of the crisis was put on third world countries. It takes a lot of courage to stand up to it. I've worked with the delegations of governments when you get a call from the White House or you get a call from, um, you know, at that time Tony Blair will cut off your aid. That's a big threat. But they did stand up to it. What's also interesting is when they keep talking about, let's just push through the Doha development round um, of the World Trade Organization. Their own research shows that if the Doha development round is really implemented, the benefit of that would amount to less than a penny per day per capita for the entire developing world. Poverty reduction would be very small. It would reach only 2.5 million people. Most important, what they don't tell you is that this benefits are not even spread out. Most of Africa, Mexico, most of Asia would lose out. And according to UNCTAD, the projections do not include many of the cost of implementing the Doha round, which UNCTAD estimates to be as much as four times the projected gains. We only have to lose. There's, not, there's nothing for us to win. And yet we keep hearing, if we just have more trade liberalization, if the Doha round of the WTO goes through, everything will be fine and dandy. That's all lies. It's very interesting that I'm back here in Seattle 10 years later. 10 years ago, it was exactly for these reasons that farmers from around the world came here and marched. How many of you were in Seattle? Would you raise your hand 10 years ago? How many of you are Americans? You sent a very strong message. I remember crying because for the first time, the world felt in a very strong way that America stood up with the rest of the world to say no to trade policies which are hurting the workers, which are hurting farmers, and hurting the environment. And it's incredible, 10 years later, we are dealing with the same lies. They keep saying, hey, trade will be wonderful because if there's a food shortage through trade, we can just send the food over to the place which needs it. It ignores the fact that there is hunger because people are too poor to buy the food. 75% of people who are identified as being living in chronic hunger are the small-scale food producers in the world. Don't send them food aid. Give them back the markets. And for that, you need WTO trade agreements out of agriculture. It hasn't shifted. The audacity of the World Trade Organization, they're meeting in Geneva on the same dates as Seattle this year. It is the same lies, what I call poor washing. The poor world needs it, the poor needs it. It's the same kind of poor washing we hear from the Gates Foundation. We need technology to feed the world. No, we need farmers' rights to land, to seeds, to water. We need living wage jobs to feed the world. We don't need genetically engineered crops to feed the world. It is amazing, it is amazing that Gates Foundation and others who have access to so much information, God, they must have so many computers, right? <laughs> they don't know that last year at the peak of the crisis, the International Assessment, I ISTAD International Assessment of Agricultural Science, Technology and Development, which was a multi-stakeholder process involving some 400 authors, scientists from around the world, it said if we want to challenge hunger, we, have to, we cannot continue with business as usual. Free trade is not the answer. GM crops are not the answer. Will somebody send them that report? Gates Foundation, which talks about, and also the World Bank, which talks about focusing on small-scale farmers, investing in agriculture. You know, somebody leaked us a copy of the confidential uh, development, um, uh, of the development strategy report from 2008 to 2011 of the Gates Foundation. It's no longer confidential because we put it up. The executive summary, the executive summary says that we invest in agriculture because we know that if you want to impact hunger, if you want to make a dent in poverty, you need to focus on small farmers. And then they go on in the executive summary to say what the vision of success is. The vision of success is farmers who are successful in the marketplace, and that would mean some land mobility. Go figure what that is. A euphemism for displacement from land. I called up the Gates Foundation and asked them if they were hiring 
because their 128-page long report did not say what you do with people who are moved off the land. When you move people off the land, say 400 or 600 million people in my own country, India, where do you move them to? You move them into cities where young men have a scar because most of them have sold one kidney? Or you move and break down families where the young girls move to Bombay and Delhi to work as domestic servants in homes? Where six-year-olds work in cafeterias where they're abused into prostitution? Is that where you move them to? Is that how Gates Foundation plans to eradicate hunger and poverty? Or you move them in boats in Africa as they try to find their way into Europe? These third world people just cannot stay in their own homes, right? Will somebody please inform the Gates Foundation like they would not want to leave Seattle, nobody wants to leave their home. And that is why, despite their rhetoric, despite that 800 pound gorilla which has all the resources in the world and is promoting its green revolution, guess what? South Africa, which does grow commercially GM crops, just today has declared they have rejected the growing and planting of GM potatoes. Yay, go South Africa. I mentioned this because when you talk about the crisis of capitalism and we keep hearing the reports and we keep seeing the stock market which looks totally upside down and our retirement money might be in it, our plans for sending a child to college, you know, our dreams, they're all tied to it. I urge you to think of the world that is around us and that's where hope lies. I mean, it is incredible. I mean, what I've talked about is very dismal and kind of sad stuff. People ask me, Anuradha, why do you do what you do? Because you know what? The farmers haven't given up hope. They continue to plant their crops. They continue to fight. Just as the WTO is getting ready to meet in November, they had a mini ministerial to grease the Indian government and get them ready, which sometimes challenges them too much. 80,000 farmers came out to protest in the streets of Delhi, just this September. And that's what really change looks like. It does not come in some innovation, in some scientific innovation. It is happening. Some people say, well, there's not as much, you know, kind of fire as we saw in Seattle. You know, our, our civil society movement, which is very diverse, which is very international, you know, it comes in different forms. The movement against the war. It is the same movement that spoke out in Seattle. It is the same movement which is talking about real change, which is saying just having President Obama in the White House is not enough change. The change is going to come with us demanding. We want to go beyond words. We want to actually see not just the end of war in Iraq, we want to see reparations to the people of Iraq. We want to end the war which is starting in Pakistan and Afghanistan. It is that kind of world, it is the same kind of civil society that is demanding that we do something about Copenhagen. So yes, they will try to criminalize dissent, yes, they will try to say it is over, but look at each one of us. That's what dissent looks like. I mean, come on you guys, you're lawyers, you should be doing something else rather than the kind of work you do, give a hand to yourself. <laughs> You've chosen a different path. And I will end and take questions if you have any, but I will share one of my favorite things which inspires me. Actually, I'll share two. One is from my mother. When I was little, she told me a story about this woman who would go out and light a candle every day at the street corner. And in some ways, and that woman reminds me of you. She would go out and light a candle every day for world peace, to for the environment, for workers' rights. One day her friend said, what are you trying to do? I've seen you do it in the last three decades. Nothing's changed. Things keep getting worse. And she said, you know what? I'm not trying to change the world. I'm just making sure that the world doesn't change me. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to keep doing what we do. We have to keep telling our truth over and over again, just as the right wing tells its lies over and over again. We cannot get tired. And lastly, I would share um, one of my favorite things from a Sufi poet, Hafez, who says, fear is the cheapest room in the house. Fear is the cheapest room in the house, my dear. You deserve better living conditions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you. Um, I'm told I have five minutes. I can take some questions. And actually, um, Maya, I forgot. Um, we have, uh, if you would like to know about the latest reports, we are a policy think tank. We publish reports, analysis. If you would like to know about them, uh, I'll ask Maya to send out a sheet. You can just put your email. If you can write in a nice handwriting, that would be very helpful if you want that information. Also, the good thing is National Lawyers Guild has an international committee, and I know Eric from, um, Nationals, um, from the international committee will be speaking to you soon. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions, a very good question. Um, I would mention one of the resources on our website, a report called Voices from Africa. Uh, African farmers and environmentalists speak out against the new green revolution in Africa. Do download it. It's for free from the website and check that out. Um, you know, it's very interesting you should say that. You know, the first green revolution uh, in the 60s, the foundation that was really behind it was the Rockefeller Foundation. And after all these years, they cannot acknowledge they made a mistake. Never mind, NPR will be full of stories about cancer trains from Punjab and Haryana in India, for instance, which were heavily into green revolution, the impact of the increased use of chemical fertilizers, what it has done, not to mention the loss of topsoil, the poisoning of the groundwater. And also, this miracle does not work forever. The declines happen. They have signed up with the Gates Foundation in the Alliance for a green, um, New Green Revolution in Africa. What's in it for them? Honestly, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, I'm sure there's some good intent, but there's a lot of misinformation. Um, they have surrounded themselves with a lot of employees from Monsanto that are now working at the Gates Foundation. And it's a top-down model approach, very similar to the World Bank. People in Washington, depends which Washington, they just seem to know better than what happens on the ground. So there are a lot of those factors. Uh, the colleagues and partners that we work with in Africa, I wish they would listen to them. They would hear what people really need. For instance, this whole focus, millions of dollars were spent on this GM potato which apparently will not uh, fall prey to uh, uh, the t moth tuber, the tuber moth. But it was not even a concern of the farmers in South Africa, and all this money has been put in by the Michigan State University, USAID, promoted by corporations. It is about creating seeds that corporations have control over. More than a billion farmers around the world do not buy seeds each year. They save their own seeds and they plant it. We do not have your patent laws. They're being changed in the third world thanks to the trade agreements. And then they come in with this technology which is patented. You need to pay Monsanto or whoever for those seeds and you're dependent on it. That's just one part of it. But um, also, if you have more questions after you've had a chance to look at a publication, send me an email. We'll be glad to continue the conversation. We were told when we were in Nairobi for the World Social Forum two years that for every dollar spent on aid to Africa with pictures of starving children, $100 comes out in unequal trade development. Do you think that's accurate? That's very accurate. If we just had, you know, those numbers which are, I was saying one of them is not new money, but also if you look at the losses that the third world governments make and the markets that they instead offer, it's actually a, a very small amount is really given to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for sending the letter. And I hope most of the people who live in Seattle and elsewhere will be sending letters to the Gates Foundation. They need to start listening.